So today's topic is going to be on um, using PyTest to do unit testing on your code. Um, as someone without formal Python training or coding training as a developer, I wasn't doing nearly as enough testing, I realized at some point. Um, and so over the summer, when I was participating in the OSPO workshop, um, they introduced PyTest to make testing just a whole lot easier. So you can test the functions and test them with different variations of what people might input or what type of data it might receive from other functions and see how robust it is, how well it will work. And it's a great way I discovered for continuing to test your code throughout your development process so that maybe you inadvertently break something and you just don't know it's broken because you haven't put it into a testing pipeline. Um, and PyTest makes this really easy, it turns out. So it was much easier, so I decided to start using it. Um, so today I'll give an overview of that and um, other people though, if you use other tools, feel free to chime in and make recommendations too. If you're better ways to do this, um, Again, I didn't do nearly enough testing, so I can't say I am a pro at this, but I'm trying to get better at testing my code. So real simply, um, I just have two files in this little folder. Um, so, but you could put the test file anywhere in the main directory of a project that you're working on. So if you had, let's say, a larger project with many subfolders, if you were developing a Django site or something, you would just put it in the main directory, and then it will access all the subdirectories to pull functions. Um, and so I just have these currently in the same um, folder, so it's automatically in the main directory folder with that. The other thing is you do have to um, install PyTest as a package. Um, and so I'm running this in a virtual environment. So since I'm using VS Code, what I do to activate my virtual environment is I go to view the command palette and I select which Python interpreter I want to use. And it shows me all my different virtual environments um, so on my machine, I use Anaconda to manage my virtual environments. Um, so as you can see, I have a list of them that I can then select from. I created a virtual environment, which basically just has the basic Anaconda packages. And then I added PyTest. That's the only thing I added to it. And I called it PyTest demo for today. Um, so. It's activated. If you use um, VS Code for your IDE, you can see what virtual environment you're in at the bottom in the right-hand corner. Mm -hmm. um, so you can always know which environment that you're using. It's really helpful. Also, the Anaconda app will also tell you what all of the different packages that you've installed in each of your environments are. Um, which is an easier way than going through Python directly, I find, and then searching through each of my different environments to see which one has the right packages. Again, I'm getting better at creating virtual environments and naming them well and knowing what I have in them and creating requirements documents. Um, but other than that, I just kind of go as I go. Um, so in this, I created a functions file which could be any file that you're planning to use, whatever functions you're planning to apply. In this, I just have two functions. One is for addition and one is for multiplication, just as examples. Um, and then you create a PyTest file, um, and it will take any file that you begin, you either call it test underscore something, or you call it something underscore test. And when you run PyTest, it will look for that file and run that file. Yes. Are you recording? I think I'm recording. There's a pause button at the top. So oh, sorry, I hope sorry. that's right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I called this one test underscore file, but you could call it anything. 
Um, and you could have multiples of these, but PyTest will look for test underscore underscore test to know when you run PyTest, which file it should look to. So this is the primary file that I'll be showing today. Um, and it will show you kind of how it works. So I import PyTest. Um, you don't necessarily have to import it. You only have to import it if you're then to use what they call fixtures of it, which I'm going to show later. Um, but it's not a problem to import, so I just start with that. And then you import the functions that you're going to be running your test on. So from my functions.file, file, um, I import my two functions. And then now I have those to run my test on. So for example, here, the first function I have is test the numbers. Um, and it's going to run a function. So this is a PyTest function. So again, I begin it with the word test. Um, and then down below, I tell it what to do. So it's then a run. And creatively, I called it test add numbers. Um, and it's going to run with A equal to 1 and B equal to 2. And then I'm going to have it print telling me that's what it's running, just so when I do the when I run the file, I'll get a printout to see what it was running. It's going then to run the function add numbers, which remember I imported from that functions file. And it's going to use the AB that I set. It's going to produce a result. And I'm going to compare that result back to A plus B, because they should be exactly the same if my function is working correctly. So now I have a test function that I can run. So again, you do want to call these test underscore something, just like you named the file test underscore, so that PyTest knows what you're referring to. So now if I drop down into my terminal window and I run PyTest, so it did one test and it passed the test. So result was equal to A plus B. Um, I don't know why it didn't do the print statement. Oh, I know. I have to do, I have it in my notes even. I have to do PyTest dash S in order to see the print statements. And there I go. It says testing with A equals to one, B equals to two. Um, so now I know that my function runs correctly, which is always useful. Um, so now what I'll do is I'll go ahead and turn that one off. Another good tip I learned from going to the OSPO workshop, promote OSPO, is on a Mac, if you do option shift A, it will turn off all of the code that you've highlighted, um, which is just a much faster way for doing this. So that's a good tip for anyone who wants to comment out lines of code quickly and then turn them back on when you're doing things. Hello. Um, so you can also add messages to your assertion clause, kind of like I added that print message. Um, so in this example, again, I'm going to run a test function called test add numbers. Um, and actually, first I'll do it with it working and then I'll do it without it working. Um, and it should test it and see if the result, oh wait, I had that right, was equal to the expected. And then it should tell me the statement as part of that assertion clause. Um, so now if I save and I do, I test. Oh, um, oh actually, I did get an error because, so you can see my function is not working. So there's an assertion error. It expected to get four, but it got three from the inputs one plus two. So this did exactly what I wanted it to do was it caught that I had an error in my code and it actually then told me what was expected and what it got instead. So if I change this now to a two, now if I run it again, 
I'm doing everything right, then it should pass the test because two plus two is equal to four. But again, if I fail the test, so I'll move it to three. Now, not only does it tell me it failed, but built into the assertion is the statement about why it failed, um, which can be quite useful because otherwise you don't know. If you're running a whole sequence of numbers, you don't know which set of numbers is the one that caused the failure. So it's a helpful way to build that right into the assertion with the expectation clause. So the next example then is where it gets even, I think, more useful. It's like, these are pretty simple. You could have tested your code pretty easily with two numbers on your own. But if you wanna test a whole number of variations to see how people might be inputting data differently and catching if they do. Um, so for example, is your function then a work if they put a negative number in? Or is it then a work if they use, um, if they put in a float, for example, and so forth. So let's go ahead and look at this one. I'll uncomment it. Yeah. So in this one, um, so in this one, we're then a test, a sequence of numbers. So I put in a list of um, groups of numbers, so a list of lists. And each one has, again, the two numbers and then what the expected number should be, because it's a very simple function. I'm just testing, does A plus B give me that? And I'm then a loop through those, so now I have a for loop. So for each of those sets, each of those tuples, then we're then a go ahead and test it and then see if we get the results that we were expecting from it. Um, there we go. So now when I run this, so it went through each of the cases and it successfully completed, so I passed. So I know that my function is robust for a variety of different permutations so it can handle negative numbers and so forth. And of course, if I change any of these, it should um, break it and it will tell me where I broke my code. And so now I know um, I was asserting to get uh, 100 plus 200 to, and it said it should be 400, which is not correct. So now I know exactly where my code broke with what type of numbers in this case, we're throwing it off. Um, again, these are simple examples, but you could imagine like if you were running through API keys and you wanted to know like, did one break because it didn't have 13 digits when it was supposed to have 13 digits, um, and you were running through hundreds of them, this would then be able to pull out and say, oh, it's this one, the one that's breaking your code and keeping it from working. Um, so then you may have to fix your code so that Things like that won't break it going forward. Um, so as you can see, all of these, I just add the word test to the beginning, which makes it real easy. Um, and it's for those who just came in, all of this is just running in a test underscore name of a file. And when PyTest runs, it looks for that file, and then it runs any function in that file that has the word test underscore at the beginning of it or at the end of it. Um, so now you can also add fixtures. Um, and fixtures are useful when you want to test multiple functions, but you want to use the same set of data to test those functions. So like before in this previous example, I created uh, test cases, and I just applied them to the one function right connected with it. But by adding a fixture, I can say, I want to create these test cases, and I'm going to use them to test multiple different functions. So you can 
um, use the same test cases in many places, which might be useful at times. Um, so I'll uncomment those and quickly walk through how that works. So first I say app pie test, and then I do dot fixture. So that's why I have to import at the beginning is because now I'm using a component of PyTest. So I have to have imported PyTest so it can find the fixture. If I didn't use a fixture, then I wouldn't have to import PyTest. It would just know what to do. And then the first thing I do is I set up my test cases and I call that a function. Um, so here I'm just setting up a function. I'm telling it to return four different test cases. Um, and here, I what I've done, since I'm then a test both my addition function and my multiplication function, I added a fourth number to each sequence. So the third number in the sequence um, should be the addition, and the fourth number is the multiplication right answer. So then what I can do is I can go through and just test my functions against those, and I use my number test cases, which is the function that I just created up here to create these. And so first I'll run it through and it will go through just as before and it will see if the addition works. So it'll do first number plus second number, does it equal third number for each of those? And then in the very next one, then I can do um, the same for the multiplication. Does the first and second multiply to be the fourth number? So again, these are simple examples, but you'll get the idea of in other places, you may want to create these fixtures. If you have a lot of functions you want to test, you don't want to have to create a sample data set for each function. If you could just create one large sample data set that has lots of permutations that may or may not work. Um, the only thing to note, uh, probably should be obvious, but maybe isn't, is since you're bringing in four numbers now, you have to have four variables listed to bring all four in. It's so like the last one for the addition, I just called it not used, just so it would bring it in. Because if you don't, if you only have three and you give it four, of course, it will break your code because it's expecting three, not four. So now if I go down to the terminal again, um, and I run this. So yeah, oh, that's the previous one, right? So it's saying that I have um, an assertion wrong and it's with my, let me see. What is it say? So it failed. Pardon? Oh, maybe. Did I not comment it out? Nope, it's commented out. So let's see here. Let me run it again to make sure I'm reading this correctly. Oh, so all of this is up here is with it too. Um, so it failed in the test add numbers, but that, oh, I see. I didn't save my file. Another good thing to always do, save your file. See, it says right over there, it says a white dot. So I had not saved my file with the latest. Um, so now it should work. Yep, there we go. So it passed on both of the two functions and it shows me exactly how my results turned out. Because again, I added the print statements to it so that I know. So if any of those had failed, I would be able to see which one of those had failed, which is really helpful. Okay. Um, yeah, if you want to get more I guess, Pythonic and get things as small and short as possible. Um, PyTest does have a parameterizing function built into it. Um, and what that allows you to do is just simply label the parameters when you are doing the fixture. So now I'm just saying 
you're going to get these four case examples and A and B, and the third one is called expected. And now when I use those, I can just put them into my function at the end. I don't have to go through and relabel them within like I was doing above. So before I was bringing those in, but then I was, um, when I would loop through them, then I would have to put in four A, B, C, do all that. And I could just do that because I've added it to the parameters now. Um, now, I'm not always a very Pythonic writer of code. Um, I prefer sometimes the longer, messier, because <laughs> then I can better understand what's happening. But I know a lot of people prefer to do as short as possible and use all these features like parameterization. So again, this is just going to go through and test these to see if they add up. Um, what did I do to my terminal? We can save on a terminal. Yep, so all four of those passed. So you can see, can write a fairly short piece of code and be able to test a lot of your functions out nicely. Um, I think I have one more example to show. Yeah, so I have been using the option shift A to comment in and out. If you don't want to do that, you can also use their high test to mark out ones that you don't want to use all the time. So an example of when I was using this was when I was writing um, some code that used an API to talk to an LLM, but I didn't want to pay for it every time it tested. So I would skip the function that actually called the LLM and test everything else. And then only every now and again would I test the whole thing so that I had I was paying for the test, even though it wasn't much. It was like two cents each time. But I tested a lot. And so all those two cents would have added up over time. So you can, instead of commenting out, the better way to do it would be to write these skips. Um, and what that will do is it marks it as a skip. And then when you run the test, it will tell you which ones you've skipped over. Um, so that it's part of your test history, which is really helpful. Let's say you had 50 things you were testing and you wanted to look at the results. You would want to see which ones had you skipped in this run um, and everything was working. And then maybe the next time you don't skip that one. So, but of course, because things do this. Oh, it does say skipped once, but I don't know why it didn't print the reason. It told me that I skipped one, but I thought it would print the reason right above it. But maybe, I don't know. I'd have to test that some more. I don't have an easy answer. But in theory, it should state the reason why you skipped the ones that you were skipping, which again, could be helpful. Or you can just comment them out and skip them that way, and it works just fine as we were seeing. So that was it. That was a pretty quick introduction, but hopefully you can see where the utility is um, when you're trying to build out anything and you want to be able to see how robust it is to different conditions. Um, so I, on another project I was working on, we were then to have people enter email addresses. But of course there's lots of variations and things that could go wrong with an email address. So testing to see whether or not we were catching all of those. Um, yeah, took a little reasoning, but then I wanted to be able to test every time I changed the code, would it still be able to catch all the different things? Like, did they forget the at sign? Did they not have a dot something or other at the end? Um, and yeah, so that's how I've been using it. And again, makes seems to make life a lot easier for this purpose. Um, I don't know. Ping Fan, does R have something similar that you run in R Studio? Hello. Um. Mm, I'm still trying to get myself familiarized with Python. I used to use Python, but right now, <laughs> um, 
I would say yes. Uh, yes, R does something similar. Yeah, I think so. Okay. <laughs> well, once you figure it out, you can present on the R version of this as well. I'm sure R has something because, I mean, once you start using it, you're like, oh, this makes so much more sense than not having something and having to just kind of, every time it breaks, you have to look at every line trying to figure out what did I possibly do wrong? Yeah. What type of data input is messing me up. This just- But, but JK is more- it's more professional than me in 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 using R. So, yeah, if JP was here, we could ask him what he's using. Um, yeah, I find it really helpful. And again, thanks to Aspo for introducing it at their summer workshop. It was one of my takeaways. That and the Option Shift A, which is hugely helpful. It's amazing mm -hmm. how much I use that just to hide things that I don't want to mess up and use them later. I used to just always put it at the bottom. Like I had like a scrap section and then I just cut and paste things down to the bottom because one line is easy, but when you have 20 lines and you're trying to put a hash mark in front of each or you're trying to do, yeah, this is just a lot easier. If you like uh, select and do command and that backslash, it puts hash in from the the lines. Oh, okay. So there's another easy way to do it. So. That was command, shift, and backslash? No, I think you just command and backslash. You can try it out. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess. Again, this is for Mac. I don't know. So command and backslash. Nope. Forward slash? Ah, there it is. Command forward uh, slash does the one line at a time method. Ah, uh, the, the commenting, yeah. See? Thank goodness for coders. I can learn all these new things. Because that really does make life a lot easier than <laughs> line by line, trying to line it all up. But I think you can you can also you can you can also have your own customized shortcuts. I do this when I install VS Code. Right now I'm using cursor, but cursor is just a another version of VS Code. Like there is a JSON file that I can define all the different shortcuts. So I just copied my R shortcuts to, like I, I want to use cursor or VS Code the same way that I use R Studio. So for R Studio, we use Command Shift C, with with C being the short uh being, uh, with C being the uh, uh, what is the word? Abbreviate. Uh, Abbreviate, yeah, abbreviate of uh of com comment, yeah, comment. So command shift C in R Studio. So I did the same thing for command shift C in uh, in uh, in VS Code. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So setting shortcuts is really good. We should have JP Roy present on his keyboarding. Um, have yeah. You ever been on a call with JP when he's on his keyboard? It's amazing how fast he typed, but he has a custom keyboard that he built for himself. And it has, as he explained it to me, it's layers. So kind of like Four one layers, layer yeah. is your basic keys. The next layer yeah. up is like command in those keys. The next layer up is like command shift in those keys. But then he has it all customized for the way he wants it. Um, and he types just so fast. Like when he does live code, it looks like it was being written by ChatGPT almost. Not quite as fast as ChatGPT, but it's really fast to watch him type. Um, I recorded it once. He was typing really fast, and the uh, the the text just appear on the screen super fast. And I just recorded for that like ten seconds, and then said to my wife, she she said, "Well, wow, that's that's amazing. That's ten times faster than than how she types." Yeah. Um, okay, well, I'll stop recording if no one else has things to say about PyTest, but... Questions. Oh, questions, good. Um, what is the idea that you would hook it into GitHub Actions and then it would test every time you deploy it or something like that? Oh, yeah, you definitely could if you want to run through all of the tests of all of your functions before you would update. Yeah, you could easily hook it to a Git. What you would probably do is it is it the pre-git actions? Pre the pre-commit actions, which we'll talk about later in the semester because we have that as a topic.
that will, yeah, you could run this file, you could run PyTest to test everything pre-commit so you could fix it before committing because you wouldn't want to commit it and then make changes and then have to commit it again if you found that it wasn't working. So a pre-commit action would be the way to go. Um, yeah, I think you can run almost anything on a pre-commit action. Uh, I feel like tests are kind of an art, um, like picking which tests to, to run. And do you have any thoughts on like how do you, I mean, obviously it's gonna vary from project to broad project, but how do you know what the scope of a test should be? How small should it be? How, how many should you have? Yeah, so like with the email one, it was just kind of like, I knew what things might not end up, like someone might not put an at sign or someone might not put a dot something other. But of course you could make it more complex. But part of it too is probably watching the data. Like if you have a live site and you're getting errors, pulling those errors into your next testing data set to say like, oh, we fixed it, but we have to make sure it stays fixed. Um, because people would do things that you'd never anticipate, of course. Um, some errors we can anticipate, but there are probably many permutations that we can't anticipate. And what I'd probably do now too is just ask ChatGPT to give me a list of possible errors to test against. And it probably has a pretty good idea of a robust set that would make that easier give you like 50 examples of how people put the wrong email stuff in. And then you could just easily test all 50 of those, which is easier than writing 40 of your own or 30 of your own and you get 50. Even if 10 aren't that useful because ChatGPT isn't perfect, who cares if you run 10 extra tests? Unless it's a huge project, it won't impact your performance or anything. I have a theory that that creating tests and maybe doing that chat GPT would, would, would help with this too. The, the act of creating the tests would help you think in the mindset of a user and would help the developer be more in that mindset of how you're going to use the tool. And so just that yeah. act of creating few tests would maybe help you harden and expand and improve the tool and make it more user friendly. I think that makes sense. Probably. I think it would probably help you write better code for it too. Like if you have things that are just overly complicating it, as you start to think through where are all the places it could go wrong, you're like, oh, maybe there's an easier way to do that rather than have that potential risk mm -hmm. in terms of, well, now that I've thought about what could go wrong, maybe I should improve the code so it's less likely to go wrong. Um, even before you run the test, you'd probably get ideas like, Oh uh, yeah, that's going to be a problem. Or why do I have to go through three loops instead of one? And could that help make that form a pull down instead of a free entry kind of thing? Yeah, all those, and then you would fix the code before it ever got the users anyway. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think you're probably right. Um, Some people do test driven development. They write the test cases first, and they write the code later. Like somebody did like that. Oh. I think that makes yeah. some sense. I've never done that. That's <laughs> for me are at the very end. <laughs> yeah. Well, I never even did them before. So I just kept testing it like live. I put it up on a website and then see what happens. Um, I think they so. become critical at, when things. you collaborate and you have multiple people starting to work on the same project. Then yeah. it's like, okay, I want to make sure that all of our pieces are working together and before they deploy. <laughs> well, and it's easy to break something doing something foolish, like touching the keyboard and adding something in before you hit save. Like since it's command S to save, I can't tell you how many times I've messed up my code by having an S in it in the wrong place. <laughs> like, But again, you're just hitting, you don't always hit in the right order and that your cursor was there and you get an S in your code and then it's all over with until you find the S and take it out. Um, so. In the world of Google where everything auto saves too, it's, it's a little bit different when you're in VS Code. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, I, I like VS Code. I know that JP moved to cursor, which is a version of VS Code with 
AI integrated, but I don't know. I haven't committed to a second AI system yet. I guess that'll take time before I'm willing to pay for multiple AIs, but I'm still paying chat GPT, so. One, like, uh, it's really good in the new model database. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, it keeps getting better. You have FOMO. JP really gets you full FOMO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he writes a lot more code than I write, though, because, yeah, I write code for fun more than for work. He writes code for fun and for work. So. I'm paying for three. Like, I'm paying for cloud, chat, GPT, and also cursor. Oh, so. Yeah. But Cursor is not a new AI. Cursor is a platform that use Cloud 3.5 as default. And also you can switch to ChatGPT 4.0. So that's a combination of Cloud and ChatGPT. So. Yeah, and I you, you can add ChatGPT into your VS code. Um, there's an application that I have. I haven't used it that much, but one of the plugins lets you you can use your API codes from any of the services for Claude or whatever. And then oh. it just uses that API code to do your um, commenting and stuff when you're using VS code. So oh. then I can look at my plugins and see actually. Um, Yeah, I'm not seeing it listed. It's in here somewhere. I guess I have too many plugins. But yeah, you can, there's definitely ways to integrate any of the different AI systems into your VS code, which is helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, if you're a VS code person, if you use a different IDE, then. Is similar to VS code or like, is there another difference? So Correct me if I'm wrong, Ping Fang, but Cursor is a version of VS Code. Like VS Code is the foundation, and then they just added onto it. But That's I don't correct. know. Yeah. If, so VS correct. Code isn't open source, is it? I think it's open source. Oh, so that's how they got it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like a fork of VS Code, but it's made by another company. Oh, so that's why they took VS Code as it's open source, and they could just build on top of it, which is makes their life easier. And now they get the charge ping pong $20 a month. So <laughs> <laughs> for their efforts. It's worth it because me and JP, we both doing the, uh, the platform development and we, we need, we need the help really bad. So. <laughs> yeah. And it's easier than jumping back and forth to chat GPT to ask it, just have it all in there. Um, I'll probably take the plunge at some point, but again, I have ChatGPT built into my VS code, so it's helping me along the way. Um, yeah. and it charges very little, like, so here, I'll stop the video, but recording. I think that would be a really interesting, um, watch of mine talking about how to, how we use, because it's always changing AI later. Let me see what I noticed the other day. So when I go to my open AI account, let me see if I have it open. Okay. Open AI login. Um, So what's interesting is, so again, I have ChatGPT tied to my VS code and I hadn't used VS code too much as of late. And so I wasn't getting charged for it, but it's hooked to a different model. And here I'll put it back into Zoom so people can see. So this is my ChatGPT usage through my API codes. Um, and so mostly I'm using the mini model for a different project. And that's why I have kind of these consistent spendings. And then they lowered the price 
And now it's a lot cheaper. So it's costing me like two cents a day to run a script. And now it's costing me like less than a penny per day. Um, but then this one is the model that I'm using with my VS code. So I can track and see like, even though it's helping me write VS code and it's giving me recommendations, it still has cost me like less than a penny to have that service over the last ever how many days this is. So it's getting so cheap. It's amazing. Um, and they don't even tell you, like they didn't tell me. Maybe they sent me an email on the 20th that said the price was going down, but it went from two cents on the 20th to less than a penny on the 21st to run the same code. Cause I know what that's doing. It's running the same script every morning. So, and you can, with ChatGBT at least, you can have separate codes for all of your projects. So you can track all your pricing. So like this is viewing it by model use, but you could also have it by, yeah. So you'd have a different API code for each of your projects. And then you could track to say like, this project is costing me this much or that much. Um, which is why I stick with ChatGPT. They seem way ahead of the others on all this support infrastructure, like for pricing and doing APIs and having multiples and so many different ways to build and store information. It's really helpful. So is it, um, yeah, enjoy the bagels. Um, <laughs> Good to have everyone here. Thanks for joining online. Good seeing you, Ping Pong, Lorena. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.